The earth is the Lord's. Good morning and welcome to the Presbyterian Church at Manning as we gather on this, the Lord's Day. If you're joining us by Facebook, we're so delighted that you are with us as well. Uh, call your attention to this insert. Uh, you've been seeing the words in the bulletin about that it's coming, but this makes it very, very real. Uh, so it's your chance to register for the Presbyterian Women's Event. This is for all women in the church, and you can uh, start to fill this out, place it in the offering plate, indicate whether you're going to be part of the arts and crafts portion or not. So it's going to be a, a great, great gathering and it's going to be a special weekend for the Presbyterian women. Uh, this is a special weekend. It's kind of a two for one in a way, the blessing of the backpacks and the apple tree. And uh, you will hear more about that from Leslie during the children's time. Uh, we have resumed for better or worse why we do what we do. And today might be a bit obscure, but I hope that at the end of it, you feel that you were glad that you uh, uh, stood uh, the, the, the sermon. So uh, we commend that to you as well. Uh, it won't be long before we return to an 11 o'clock worship, but we still have these uh, dog days of August uh, and 10 o'clock. Uh, school has started for some. It will be starting up for others. Uh, please note the Lake Mission trip, which is scheduled for the 19th and 20th of the month, but uh, more importantly, next Sunday is just going to be a great Sunday where you hear the reports about why we do what we do, which is send young people on mission trips. So we look forward uh, to that. Please notice that there will be a kind of a, a practice time at 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock for uh, all those who went on the mission trip. So we commend that to you. What? All. All. All, nine o'clock, spread the word, nine o'clock. And then on the 20th, we have a, a session meeting, uh, maybe even two session meetings that day as we have a, a couple that wants to join the church on the 20th. So that's, that is exciting as well. Um, you see the rest of the events. I trust that you picked up a newsletter last week, and we're very, very thankful for that. Uh, I believe that covers all that we need to announce during this time. So let us stand for the call to worship. We call out to you, O Lord. Because you are the God who answers prayers. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Come, let us worship God. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, your psalm says, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And when you were speaking to Moses, you told him to take off his shoes to, because he was on holy ground. He covered his face. There was no bowing, but there was this posture before you. Lord, today we come before you and we ask that our hearts would be open to you, that we would praise you, that our minds would be open to you, that we would adore you, that we would leave here more fully aware of how worthy you are of our praise and honor. So Lord, be with us as we gather as a community of faith to give you praise and glory, to adore your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The psalmist says that God knows when we stand up and when we sit down. The psalmist continues, before a word is on our tongue, the Lord knows it all together. Surely, even if we have held our tongue, there are times when, when the word was on the tip of our tongue, but it has already registered with God, and we fall short. Our standards fall short to God's standards. We remain seated when we should, would, it would be better to stand. We stand with the masses rather than sit one out. We perhaps have lost our sense of awe, wonder even, fear to be in the presence of the Lord. Our posture may have become entirely too casual. We may not know how to stand at attention before our Creator. Perhaps the coronation of King Charles reminded us of how it is to be in the presence of royalty. Let us confess our need to be more mindful of being in God's presence. Lord, we rise for the bride. We rise for the family at a funeral. We stand for the national anthem. We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Lord, we confess we have not always stood for you. We have not stood up for Jesus Christ. We have stood for things for which one should not stand. We knelt before other things. We have bowed before idols. Lord, there are also times that we wanted to stand, but our bodies were too frail. Examine, we ask, the posture of our hearts this day. Show us mercy, we pray. We fall on our knees asking for forgiveness. Heal us by the acts of the one who knelt in the garden. Forgive us, we pray. Let us confess that we may not have been like the prodigal son taking our time to fall before our father. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Friends, Joseph's brothers fall before him. He tells his brothers, the ones who wished him harm and ill will, that he would not hold their actions against them. Having confessed our sins to the Lord, having knelt to ask for forgiveness, hear these words. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. So friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Women curtsy before royalty. 
people bow before Jesus to ask for a healing. It's hard to ignore someone who is bowing. And a beggar is told to stand up because Jesus has heard him. Let us come before God with our petitions and our intercessions. Let us pray. Lord God, before whom the Magi bow and bring gifts. Lord Christ, who noticed the sinner who would not look up during his prayer. Lord God, who hears Hannah standing at the temple and praying. Lord God, who strengthened Daniel and his friends when they would not bow before a statue of the king, but instead worshipped you, the true king. We come before you today, perhaps with much on our minds, or perhaps not that much. Maybe we simply want to thank you for the many blessings that you have given us this past week and in our lives. Perhaps this has been a great summer. Perhaps it's been a challenging summer. Perhaps we're glad that school has started or is about to. Perhaps we wish we had another month. Maybe we heard the soothing sounds of a cool, clear mountain stream or the pounding of the surf. Maybe we even had the good fortune to hear both these past few months. Perhaps instead, though, we heard the sound, the beep of an IV rehydrating us or giving us needed medicines. Perhaps we've heard the joy of friends and family around the picnic table or we've peeled some shrimp on the dock. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet things in this life. We thank you for the way you've stood by us in the hard times. Today, Lord, we pray for new parents, for expecting parents. We pray for those wanting a child. We we pray for teachers. We pray for good aunts and uncles. We pray for students who will receive the gifts from the apple tree. We pray for the Clarendon Christian Learning Center and their witness. And Lord, we pray for these on our prayer list. We ask that you will remember Vicki and Vivian and Bill, Elizabeth and Kathy, Chuck and Mary Alice, Dwight and Morgan, Anne and Dot and Lamar, Teresa and Jack and Tommy, John and Philip, Rick and Betty, Mary Catherine and Bob, Kathy and Willie, Hattie and Spencer, Margaret and Mallory, and Miss Lila. And Lord, you know the ones that we have on our hearts and minds, and we bring them before your throne of grace, asking that you would intercede, that you would bring a healing, that you would bring a blessing. We pour out these names before you. And Lord, confident that you have heard these prayers, we've joined together as one body, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Him with the children. <laughs>
Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. So I have a question for you guys. Something is getting ready to start or has already started for some of you. Can you tell me what it is? School. Summer is ending. School is starting. Come here. Oh, you want to grab? You can grab one thing. Will you bring one thing over for us? Well, school is starting, and school can have, we can feel a lot of different things when school is starting. What's, what's a feeling you might have about school starting? Yes? So you can be a little bit nervous because you're starting a new school, like middle school. Yep, that's a big deal. Or you might be even going to a new school. Sometimes that, ha that happened to me when I was a kid a couple times. Yes, what other feelings might you have? You have a happy feeling. We can feel happy. We can feel nervous. We can feel excited. We can feel a little bit scared. It's always interesting to start something new. Well, I wanted to share with you guys. So today, we're going to bless your backpacks. And I'm going to give Oh, that's okay. I'll give you this anyway. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you guys this. This is a cross for you to put on your book bag, and it has a tag on it. Okay? And he did? Well, on this tag it says blessed. And it says this backpack has been blessed by the Presbyterian Church at Manning who loves, prays for, and supports the students. So you guys can put this on your bag. Okay? And then on the other side of it, on the other side, it says be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 9. So I have one of these for each one of you, okay? And you can put it on your book bag, and I'll show you how you do that. Uh -huh, don't do it now. I'll show you in Children's Church how we can do that, okay? Oh, they kind of got stuck together. Now, um... So this way, your book bag, you'll know that your book bag has been blessed. Box! There you go. There you go. There you go. Okay. So the other thing I have for you guys is, are school days kind of a long day? Yes. Right? And after a long day, do you like to get a little treat if you've done a good job? Yes. So I have a little gift for you. After school, you can go get a little treat for being a good student. Yes. Fox, you want one of these? He's like, no, thank you. Yeah, you probably want one. How much soup? There you go. <laughs> it's enough for you to get maybe a french fries or a milkshake. Not boats. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you guys are blessed because... You have a church that loves you. You have a treat. You have your book bag. You have your school supplies. Things are getting ready. Well, you know what? Not everybody has all of that. And so our church has been col collecting school supplies, okay? And we're going to take those to the... You want the crayons? Oh, okay. Yeah, you might need them. Yeah. Well, you know what? We are going to take those to the school to share them with students who maybe had a hard time collecting all their school supplies. That list was long. It's a long list of supplies you have to get. Yes. I still have not found orange plastic folders. If anybody, with prongs, if anybody sees them, I need three. Okay. Oh, you got them at Target? Okay, go. Go, go, go. I don't know. That's what they just put on the list. Yeah. Yep. I got the blue ones, but not the orange ones, yeah. Uh, oh, we're, gonna, we're digressing. How about this? Can you guys put your book bags in the middle, and we will pray for them? John, do you want to go grab a thing of those crayons, and we will pray for them as well? Oh, would you put those in the middle, too? Let's pray. Let's pray for them as well. Okay? Here we go. Let's put them in the middle and we'll put our hands on them. Ready? 
Okay, here we go. Ready? These can be the symbols. Are you going to get a pack? There you go. Get those cool markers. Yes. All right, put them right here. Let's all put our hands right here on the book bag. Ready? Repeat after me. Oh, you can sit right here. Okay. Can you sit that box? There we go. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you for us. thank you for loving us. Be with us at school. Be with, us at school. Be with all the teachers. All the students. Help us to have a good year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. If you're joining us by Facebook, I don't think you can see all the good supplies that are up here in the two, two chairs that are on the floor level, but it's just a, one of the examples of the generosity of, of this congregation. Uh, if you're joining us by Facebook, the, the sermon title today is Jenny Geddes and the Asterisk, For What Do We Stand Literally? Whatever you do, don't upset the women of the church. Has that been said before? Whatever you do, don't upset Helene Ellis. Whatever you do, don't upset Mary Alice Ipoch. At the Catholic Church, whatever you do, don't upset. well, I'm not even going to say a name. And whatever Jenny Geddes because she she throws things she throws things whatever you do don't upset Cooper Thornton whatever you do don't upset don't upset Virginia Cottingham woe to the preacher who upsets the Presbyterian women and I'm talking about Presbyterian women from way back, way, way back, five years ago, when the Cooper Thornton of Edinburgh, Scotland, took her stool, perhaps a milking stool, and threw it at the worship leader. Yes, she threw a chair during worship. Well, there are different versions of the story, but it all comes down to a change in worship and it most likely involved a change in posture. One is that there was a request for kneeling, and that the Presbyterian woman was not going to stand for any kneeling. She would stand up for standing up, she would stand up for sitting, whatever, you get the idea. She was a stand-up, upstanding believer. As you recall from the Sermon on Debts and Trespasses, the English and the Scots have always gotten along. Always. Yeah, and the Scottish people said debts, but other than that, there were no real differences. I'm winking at y'all. No real, no real differences at all. But you know, then old Jane Geddes had to go and make a mess of things by her furniture fight and purport accent she intoned something like is that a mass I hear in my ear the Episcopalians were trying to change worship in other words she asked are you coming into my church to install kneelers I don't think so so we come back to why we do what we do, and this week we look at why we stand, if able, where we stand. Or ask differently, what makes an item in the bulletin have an asterisk beside it? Who decides that? Is there a reason for it? Or 
So what do we stand for, or for the English teachers? For what do we stand? Is it only because an Episcopalian tried to change worship in the Scottish church? Let's look at what scripture has to tell us about our posture and worship. Sitting, standing, kneelings, and I'm going to restrict my focus to New Testament passages. One could find various passages in the Old Testament, but I believe these from Matthew and Luke will help us the most. And I guess if you're the kind of person who does whatever the preacher says do, like if I go this way and you stand up, and if I do that you stand up, you could go ahead and, and leave. But inquiring minds want to know. For people who love worship, for people who want to show their love for God, their respect for the supreme being, stick around. Whatever it is we'd like to explore, let's do so in the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Lord, what is it like to be in your presence? Lord God, may your spirit guide the posture of our hearts. May your spirit cause our mind to straighten up and our ears to open up and our lives to light up. We ask this in Jesus' name. Four short scriptures from Matthew from the Christmas pageant. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, the king saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. From the first Sunday in Lent, Matthew 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, the devil said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. And from Matthew's miracle stories, Matthew 8, notice the posture of the one needing a healing. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. In Matthew 9, Jesus said, Pour new wine into new wineskins, and both will be preserved. While Jesus was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but you but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. This is the word of the Lord.
from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus' first sermon, if you will, and then his next to the last prayer that he offered. His hometown and then the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice his posture for preaching and praying. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. News about him had spread throughout the whole country. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he'd grown up and on the Sabbath he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and give recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone were on him. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his, sweats, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. This is the word of the Lord. The choir sees this sometimes. I see this sometimes. Where there's somebody on one of the first pews who stands up in worship and instinctively some people behind them stand up also. Others are looking at the bulletin. Is there an asterisk? Are we supposed to be standing now and then the person on the front usually sits down but then everybody else wants to support that person so they're standing up and it's like a popcorn congregation all because one person was convinced that they should stand up that everyone should stand up at that point are we supposed to be standing now we don't want worship to be confusing we have what is called an order of worship. Not a program, an order of worship. We want worship to be orderly. We like the predictable. Jenny G., the one who took aim at the worship leader, didn't like the new order of worship. She didn't like the English either, but she really did not like the new order of worship. Yet behind all of this, there is this underlying question is there a posture for worship? How do we posture our bodies in worship? We heard about the wise men kneeling and bowing down. We heard about Jesus kneeling in prayer. We heard of at least two people on their hands and knees asking Jesus for something. We heard of Jesus' sitting and his standing. Is there one right way and only way to worship God. What about you? And I'm going to just ask you, just if you feel comfortable raising your hand. Have any of you knelt at the communion rail of a Methodist church? Okay, all right. Have you ever, any of you pulled out or dropped down the kneelers at a Lutheran church? Okay, good. Have any of you come down the aisle, knelt, and made the sign of a cross in an Episcopal church or a Catholic church? Okay, all right. That's kneeling. 
I suspect that most of you have at least once here stood to receive at least one element of communion. You walked forward, you stood still, you were given a piece of bread, and then you dipped the bread into the chalice. It was a departure from the more usual, our more usual, sitting in the pews and waiting for the tray to come by you. So we know that even in this place, for one particular activity, for one particular sacrament, we have used at least two different postures in worship. We have placed our body at a certain point and place, and we've consented that our body placement, in theory, somehow impacts our mindfulness, our thought. One thinks differently with a different posture. Uh, teachers will be telling students, stand up straight <laughs> when you're in line. And believe you me, somebody at Paris Island knows the difference between at ease and attention. It's a world of difference between those two postures. When one gets down on a knee and pulls out a little hinged box, we know one is thinking differently. Posture indicates, posture predicates action and thought. There is literally such a thing as body language. We, we don't kneel. We stand and we sit. But why do we stand when we do? Or Luther might ask us, why don't we stand for the reading of the gospel? As we heard in our scriptures, Jesus sat down to preach. I know my own father in his later years had to make his peace with using a stool for sitting while preaching. He would have rather stood, but his body was not able. We think of preachers standing to preach. We think of the choir standing to sit, right? If they stay seated, you'd wonder, hmm. What's going on there? And when you think about the iconic round windows that are in, uh, usually above the choir, this church is an exception, there are usually two windows. One, we see that Jesus is carrying that lost sheep over his shoulders. And the other is where Jesus is kneeling in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He does not have long before his arrest. It is only Luke that tells us that Jesus knelt. Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 says that Jesus fell on his face. Mark 14 35 says that Jesus fell on the ground. But can't you just see Jesus kneeling? Can't you see him in that prayer posture? John 17, 1 and the verses follow, finding Jesus in prayer, recalls that Jesus did with his eyes lift them up towards the heaven. No mention of his body posture, but I have to tell you, I have seen the image of Jesus kneeling in Gethsemane so many times that when I hear John say that Jesus was looking up, I just know in my mind that Jesus was kneeling. Heinrich Hoffman's painting is the classic. There's some light in a corner of the sky. There's a little bit of light over Jesus' head. There's some light that focuses on Jesus' hands that are on that massive piece of stone like an altar. That large stone and those hands, the hands that had done miracles for those who had knelt before him the Lord's elbows on that large stone. Similarly, artist Gerard David includes the large rock, but it's behind Jesus. Jesus is kneeling and he's got his hands raised toward the heaven. We often associate getting on our hands and knees and praying. Somebody might say, you better get on your hands and knees and pray. Even the rock group, The Who, makes a reference to kneeling in the song, We Won't Get Fooled Again. We get on our knees and pray. 
Perhaps the Gethsemane image in Luke is that powerful, that iconic, that it influences even the lyrics of a secular song. And our hymns today, well, their lyrics are all about standing, even if for the hymn with the children we remain seated to sing about standing. Ironic. We have an asterisk in the bulletin for standing. Uh, some people might call that a little star. Uh, but what would you put in a bulletin as a symbol for kneeling? When do we stand and why? Perhaps the simple answer to that question is, if there's an asterisk, the answer to that simple question is this. If there's an asterisk in the bulletin, that's when we stand. And the reason? Well, I guess, tradition. Perhaps not a tradition that anyone can even explain completely, but it's our tradition. The test for the power of a tradition would be this. If you were to stand for the gospel, if you were to stand for the whole sermon, if you knelt during the prayer, people would look at you. They would wonder about you. Why is she doing that? What's he, what's he doing? And frankly, if we didn't have pews and if we only had milking stools and you didn't throw them at the preacher, we'd probably be standing as well or sitting on the floor. Even churches without pews tend to have chairs. Believe it or not, there's a website that is churchchairs.com. You want to guess what they sell? church chairs I mean every church has some element of a place for somebody to sit you sit in the chairs until it's time to stand up and sing we don't stand that much in worship really we sit more and then again there's this purely human purely practical element you've heard the phrase which I will start but I'm not going to finish the mind can only absorb as much so we stand from time to time. Apparently one needs to, for the sake of understanding and comprehension, stand every now and then. So anatomy, shall we say, even comes into play in our worship practice. What do we do when traditions change? When people assign certain values to a particular posture? That's a great question. I found this fascinating in the uh, recent change in the Episcopal Church's Book of Common Prayer. And this is what they say, and I quote, Recent liturgical reforms following the ancient practice of the church encourage the congregation to stand for prayer during most of the times of the service when kneeling has been customary. And they go on with this rationale. Many believe that standing for the Eucharistic prayer, that's communion, emphasizes the Eucharist to be a celebration in community rather than an expression of penitence by individuals. So the Book of Common Prayer imparts that there's a, it's more communal to stand than it is to kneel. I'm hard pressed to follow that thinking, frankly. If I'm kneeling and everyone else is kneeling, I feel like a group. Perhaps even more so because it takes more effort for me to kneel than for me to stand. But that's the Church of England's people and that's their story to work through. I conclude with this. No matter what one's posture is in worship, at some point, at least according to the hymns, we need to stand up. We stand up for Jesus. It's like we give Jesus a standing ovation. We feel motivated, and then we tend to stand up. There's something in our physicality, there's something in our DNA that seems to force us to stand, to rise to our feet, when some internal energy, some internal holy stirring gets to a certain point within us. We just stand up. We might stand and even say something. Even a Presbyterian has been known on some occasion 
to stand up and say amen even if there's not an asterisk in the bulletin. It has happened. It might have even happened. We'll see. I'm yet to see it in the two years I've been with you, but we could at least give intellectual consent that somewhere in some Presbyterian church, somebody might just stand up and go, amen. And we might look at them. Sometimes life brings us to our knees. Other times prayer brings us to our feet. And at times we need to hear and to feel, I'll stand by you. I'll stand in for you. I'll stand with you. What's that old song? Stand by me. Stand by me. Wrapping up, and I want to be very careful here. I won't. I personally want to say that God doesn't care about our physical posture in worship. But I'm not God. I can't know the mind of God. And God may indeed care very deeply about a physical posture. But as I read scripture, it seems that God is more concerned, that Jesus was more concerned, especially with the Pharisees, about the posture of the heart than about the words or the outward appearances or a physical posture. Is it too fine of a point to say one can kneel, one can stand with one's arms raised up and still the heart be far from God? I think God looks more at the heart than at the posture. The more important portion seems to me to ask, where is your heart today? Or, does your heart have an asterisk in front of it? Does your heart have an asterisk in front of it? Let's pray. Lord, you made us to respond to you. Uh, were your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, to come into our house, we might stand. We might bow, we might fall on our knees, we might fall on the floor, we might fall on our face, we might not feel worthy to look up, we might look him deep in his eyes. Whatever our posture, Lord, we ask that you would give us worshipful hearts. And then, Lord, may we position ourselves to be of service in your name to those around us. Draw us closer to you that something within our hearts quivers and shakes and acknowledges that we are in your powerful, loving presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Well, the swinging shepherds from the sheep of the Savior were tied with the Sourwood Church of Christ, an example of some highly unholy behavior in a game that had already been protested twice. Something unbiblical must have been said for them to be aiming heat at the minister's head. Clocking the clergy ain't the thing to do, but neither's the high hard one on a O oh and two. And then comes the chorus about the church league softball fist fight. Well, 23 and me might just reveal that uh, some of the people on that team uh, had some of Jenny Getty's uh, kin in them. And as Tim Wilson recounts, there had been a laying on of hands under the left field floodlights that night. That's not the way to demonstrate which church you go to, okay? Uh, we encourage you to exhibit the right kind of commitment to your church. No fist fights, please. No chair throwing, please. We ask you to do the more civil, sign the pad. Pass it up and down the pew, take out the sheet, put it in the offering plate. That's kind of more who we are, and that exhibits our commitment. Uh, I want you, though, to take this opportunity to reflect upon the way that there are people who need to hear that God loves them, God wants them to worship him, that God wants to have a vital part in their lives and I encourage you to find those folks and invite them to come worship with us if not here worship someplace else uh, at this time in the portion of the service we give thanks for what God has given us and we uh, receive those uh, offerings that make it possible to give gift cards and little tags that hang on the book bags of children going to school so let us remember all that God has done for us as we give our tithes and offerings. Just as you fill children with the expectation of a good year at school, with learnings and joys and reconnecting, we pray that you would fill us also with good things, with joys and opportunities to learn and the chance of reconnecting with you and other believers and connecting others to you so that they too might believe. We ask that you receive these offerings, use them, multiply them, bless them, use them for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn, uh, you'll see the reason I picked it. It's in the little uh, parentheses below. My hope is built on nothing less. Hymn 379. <laughs> Remember that God loves you, that God is calling upon you to be a better Christian, that the Spirit longs to disciple you in that process, for indeed you cannot do it on your own. Leave here today full of the good news that whatever posture you take, that Jesus Christ is the solid rock upon which we stand. Come back next week to feed upon the word of God. Tell and invite others. Carry the strong name of Christ with you and never forget the love Lord Jesus Christ, the friendship, the fellowship, the power of the Holy Spirit, not only for you, but for those whom you love, not just this day, but even forevermore.
Oh man. <laughs> 